picture throughout, um, or video, but please stay clear of the aisle here and our official paparazzi. Yes. Um, yep, so, I'd please like to call up Alana Goldstein and Gabriella Illen to open with a passage of the hymn. Shir Hamalu Ledavid, Kine Matobu Manayim, Shavet Afim Gamyachad, Kashamin Hatob Harosh, Al Harosh, Yored Al Azakan, Zakena Harosh, Shared Al Pi Midotab, Ketal Hermon, Shared Al Hurre, Sion, Kishan, Sivaronai, Atavracha, Chaim, Al Haolam. A song of a sense of the Eden. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brothers also to dwell together. As the good oil on the head runs down upon the beard, the beard of Aaron which runs down on the mouth of his garden. As the dew of Hermon which runs down on the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord commanded the blessing of life forever. Hi everyone, welcome. We've got a lot of you visiting for a second night in a row because of 12th grade graduation, so welcome back. It's very exciting. Um, okay, I would also like to give a special welcome to our community rabbis who are here. They also happen to be parents of our students, Rabbi Goldstein from Congregation No Festic of Synagogue, and Rabbi Skolnick from Congregation to Care of Israel. Welcome. Um, okay, and I'd like to give a special welcome and congratulations to Leah Dyke for completing her first year as the Girls High School Program Director. So, junior high is a time for students to grow in their independence, to learn to approach life with a growth mindset, to take risks, step out of their comfort zones, learn from their mistakes. As I'm sure you all know, and if you remember from your eighth grade, you've all faced challenges this year, academically, socially, emotionally, but you've really come out stronger and more capable. And now you're ready to embark on the next chapter of your life as you enter high school. It's really nice to have so many freshman speakers here this year. Don't worry, you'll be so enthralled, it'll go so fast. Um, seriously. <laughs> no, I actually got to take a sneak peek of what they're saying, and really, you're in for a treat for tonight. These students are so much personality in this class. Everyone's really their own unique person. You'll, you'll get to see for yourself. They've worked really hard for Mr. Ryan to prepare, and he really wishes he could be here tonight, but he is definitely thinking about you and sending you positive vibes. Okay. So, without further ado, I now present the eighth grade freshman speech for the class of 2027.
to a strange land called Ohio. <laughs> At the Columbus Jewish Day School, I had my second new kid experience, joining a group of third and fourth graders. I adjusted to the new environment and especially the new climate. After my graduation from CJDS, I journeyed to a place that seemed even further than Florida, the Columbus Torah Academy. Along with the obvious changes, COVID presented its own layer of adjusting. After a crazy seventh grade year, finally, I made it to the climax of a hero's journey, eighth grade. On the DC trip, I grew closer with my classmates. And just as importantly, I've blossomed academically with my newfound love for science and new acquired writing skills, taught from the best. It's a paradox. Nothing in life is constant but change. I didn't choose to move from New York to Florida or to Ohio, but everything ended up being for the better. Even when you're in one place, you don't know what change awaits. A pandemic, the loss of your great-grandfather, or even Hurricane Irma. All you gotta do is keep moving on. No matter where you are or what you're doing. <laughs> the trick is always adapting and finding your place, no matter how long it takes. Thank you to everyone who helped me on my journey through time and change. Board and became paralyzed with fear. The dark pool water stared up at me tauntingly and I just couldn't bring myself to do it. This unfortunate scene was unfolding in Camp God Is Me. It was just after first grade in my first year of camp and I was loving it. I especially loved swimming. Although I wasn't swimming in the deep end yet, I still enjoyed being in the water and having fun. After swimming every day, a couple of friends and I would stay later for swimming lessons. One day, the swimming instructor decided that we were going to practice in the deep end. He decided that we would start by jumping off the diving board. So there we stood, trembling near the diving board, nervously anticipating our turn. One after another, the kids all jumped up. Eventually, it was my turn. I told the instructor that I was too scared, but he wouldn't let me get out of doing it. Without any warning, the tall, scary lifeguard picked me up and threw me into the pool. The loud splash as my body hit the cold, deep water was shocking in more ways than one. As I gasped for air and tried to reach the edge of the pool, I was furious at the lifeguard until I realized that, hey, I was okay. I was swimming. I had been chucked like a diving weight off the diving board, and I was okay. Since then, I've learned to swim pretty well, if I may say so myself, and I'm able to confidently jump and even dive off the diving board. While I do not recommend pushing a first grader, or anyone for that matter, off the diving board, I did learn a lot from that lifeguard, a lot more than swimming. I learned about believing I could do hard things. I also learned that when I don't believe in myself, it is so important to have someone else that does believe in me, someone to give me that push, whether literally or figuratively. If I surround myself with good friends and mentors that will push me and encourage me, I can achieve things I never thought I could achieve. Throughout life, it is so easy to get scared away from amazing opportunities. Whether it's because you're scared of it, or you just feel that for whatever reason, it's too risky. But it is so important to be able to have that confidence and dive into that new opportunity. As we go into high school, I know that there will be many things that we will be nervous or not excited to do. But I know that we'll have the friends, mentors, and I guess lifeguards that will believe in us and push us to take that leap of faith and dive into that new opportunity. Four to one. No, I'm not talking about the ratio of my absences to appearances at school this year. The ratio, four to one I have in mind, is far, far more terrifying. This is the ratio in my class of girls to boys. <laughs> When I walked into the walls, to the halls of 181 on Bixby Road as a kindergartner, I was shocked and overwhelmed to see such an extraordinary number of girls. The girls lifted their power, power of numbers over us boys. 
I would typically hide during an intense game of dodgeball, but to no avail. The girls pelted me with dodgeballs. I would walk into class to see a professional hair salon where expert French reading classes were given. <laughs> My master hair reader, Arena Hero. After a long and dreary day, I'd arrive home to find an identical version of the school hallways with Nini, Atara, and yes, Ari, playing the role of hairstylists and pro TikTokers. There was no escape. In truth, I always felt as if I'd been outnumbered, as if things never went my way, and that everything was targeted against me. Although it was hard to navigate this unfamiliar world together, my classmates and I, female and male, persevered nine years of fighting and arguments while still growing as a class together. My name, Eitan, is connected to our forefather, Eitan Mizrahi, also known as Avram Avinu. He pushed through being outnumbered in situations more important than mine. Thankfully, I too pushed through. <coughs> now it's time for the thank yous. Thank you, Ava, for constantly embarrassing me but making up for it by driving me to the next NCSY event. Thank you, Ima, you're the best mom a middle child could be ignored by. <laughs> Thank you, Nini and Abi, for not being home. Thank you, Ari and Atara, for giving me countless chances to work on my anger management. Thank you to all my relatives for seeing me once a year, and not more than that. <laughs> Jokes aside, you and many others have each shaped me to the person I am today, and for that, I am truly grateful. Next year, I will be off to Yeshiva, but I am grateful for the lessons I learned from my years at CTA. So I implore you all, my classmates, who are about to embark on a four-year journey throughout high school together, that if you were to take one thing from this speech, I hope it would be to stay true to your ideals and outnumbered, to never stray from what you think is right, no matter who tells you otherwise. Staying true to yourself shows the world who you are as an individual and who the Jews are as a nation. Leading them on trips to the drinking fountain, 
or sometimes on journey across the school to the gym. Nothing was as special. Sure, being the lunch leader or the dominating leader was cool, but being the line leader was practically everyone's life, life goal, a position of supreme rank. It was not just about stat status or feeling important, but having responsibility for the whole class. If there was a straggler in the back, you had to make sure to keep them in line. You would have to make sure the class walked single file, and you also had to make sure everybody was quiet. If there was a classmate talking too loudly, it wasn't his or her fault, it was your fault. The line leader was accountable. These small acts of preschool accountability were one of the first forms of leadership I had ever experienced, and the, lead, and the lesson stuck with me. All these years later, after witnessing countless acts of accountability, I wonder, what does it mean to take accountability of yourself and others? When you realize you've made a mistake, whether it's forgetting to take up the trash, or encouraging your friends to make bad decisions, you have to admit it to yourself. Instead of running from your mistake, making excuses, excuses, and denying it ever happened, you should face the problem head on and say, that's my fault, it won't happen again. This shows that you learn from your setbacks and become better. As we mature, stakes rise. Fewer of us want to accept account accountability for our choices. But to become the best version of ourselves, to become our own line leader, we have to own our mistakes so that, so that we can avoid them in the future. On this day, my last day of middle school, a great achievement, 
My mind is drawn instead to some of my failures. For some reason, one failure stands out. A failure that cost me my dignity, my pride, and most of all, my money. I was eight years old, and my older brother Boaz was 10. We had yet to get my mother a gift for Mother's Day. My Aunt Jen supplied us with flowers, a card, and delicious looking chocolate bars. My brother, ever exotic, looked at the chocolate bar labels. His face was all I needed to see to know what was on the bar, or not on the bar, for that matter. There was no hex shirt on the wrapper. This meant not only could we not eat the chocolate, but just having it in our house was wrong, according to the laws of Judaism. The only solution, hide the chocolate in my closet. <laughs> Over the course of that night, the temptation became irresistible. I obsessed about the candy, until finally, I caved. But I was soon mortified when my crime was discovered by a force scarier than Hashem himself. My brother, in his Star Wars pajama set, <laughs> stared down at his little Jewish sister noshing down on non-kosher chocolate. His face turned into a smirk. His response? Blackmail. <laughs> he set the terms at $5 a day for keeping my dirty secret. <laughs> His actions, extortion, a third degree felony, according to the Ohio Penal Code, <laughs> only continued for a few days until I ran out of money. He soon spilled the beans or chocolate, as it were. My crime, or failure, was that of my own will. As insignificant as the chocolate bar was, it was a tiny moment in which I put my immediate wants in front of my beliefs. The chocolate was set in front of me as a test, and I failed. I didn't lose the big game for my team. I didn't drop the softball. I didn't bomb a math test. I put myself above my customs and values that derived from the Torah. Over the course of my time at CTA and my upcoming transition into high school, I'm aware that temptation could pose as a problem. The temptation to blow off studying and get Starbucks with all mods, the temptation to look cool in front of my peers, and so much more may be hard to overcome. I've learned them at CTA and with the help of my family that my love for Hashem and moral values will always come first, or else I'll face the consequences of my actions, or worse, the wrath of Boaz Harrow and his Chewbacca PJs. <laughs>
learned a completely different lesson. She learned independence. She learned how to not need someone for every baby step and to take on challenges on her own. So maybe the true, the true lesson of this story isn't the lesson of the story. The lesson is the lesson of the lessons. <laughs> Bina and Aaliyah Newman were at the same place at the same time and can, t and can tell the same story, but, but learn different things. We sometimes see the same things, but we come out of it with different lessons, depending on our point of view. All that being said, both Bina and Aaliyah learned that unlike glow sticks and wishbones, noses are better unbroken. <laughs> There was something so satisfying about that first pop. Just kidding. Definitely not. All I will say is that it was an experience that I would not recommend. What am I talking about? I'm talking about the time that I dislocated my brother's arm. Now, before you start throwing tomatoes at me, let me explain. I was four years old, playing with my brother arm, who at the time was two years old, on stacked boxes. We had built a bridge out of the boxes, and we were climbing on them. Suddenly, arms off. I, being the nice, helpful, thoughtful sister I am, reached out to help him out. Unfortunately, I must have pulled too hard, and his arm popped out of its socket. Now, I don't remember the details. I just remember my mother rebuking me, telling me that I should have been more careful. I, however, just felt like I was being a good, helpful sister, and didn't do anything wrong. For some reason, though, I still felt guilty. Fast forward to this year. While talking to my mother, I brought up the story. Suddenly, my mother stopped me and said, Aliza, that is not what happened. You were spinning him around by the arm when I told you not to. <laughs> huh? That is not what I remember. When thinking about what my mother told me, I feel like I vaguely remember the incident. Now, I don't know the psychology behind it, but I must have been so guilt-ridden that I subconsciously changed the memory. This taught me an important lesson. We shouldn't be scared to admit our mistakes. I hope that if this would have happened to me now, I would be able to grow from it and not deny it. If life were always smooth sailing, there wouldn't be any growth. Going into ninth grade, there will be many instances where we will mess up and make mistakes, whether academically or socially. However, these mistakes aren't to be forgotten or denied. Rather, we should admit them and use them to grow and move on to become better people. It is our mistakes that form us into the people that we become. So, words to the wise, it's okay to dislocate your brother's arm, although it's debatable. Just make sure not to deny it. Remember, honesty is the best policy. One day, when I was in third grade, the principal, Mrs. Delman, paid a visit to our house. Obviously, the matter was serious. But Ariel and I didn't understand the significance until later, when the results of that meeting showed up. On the last day of summer, a boy arrived with tefillin, a wheelie backpack, and a suitcase. His name was Nussum. Our adjustment began. Nussum and Ariel hated each other. Like his middle name, Wolf, would suggest, Ariel was very territorial. He didn't like the new kid cramping his face. After school, Nelson and I would sit behind the couch, watching NASCAR or Survivor together, while Ariel walked around the house saying, Nelson, where'd you go? <laughs> Our relationship grew as the three of us started to see and treat each other as, well, siblings. Whether we were breaking up each other's fights or just hanging out on Friday nights or Shabbos afternoons. Soon our border was part of the family. So the next year, when the three moved to town, Ariel and I were very upset. Our loss didn't last long when Avi Maltinsky came into the picture. The next year, my new border brother. As I traveled through the rough path of middle school, in all of my years doing homework at the dining room table with my different border brothers, I looked up to them. Nasan and Avi, okay, Ariel too. I mean, if Ariel can make it through high school, I probably can't. <laughs> In some ways, the people who come into our lives are not random. Every time you encounter someone or sit next to a stranger, I bet you can learn something new. And possibly that person will have some influence on your life. 
If my parents had never opened their doors back in 2018, who knows where my life would be now without Nelson's family living down the street from us. First impressions may be scary, but when you get to know someone, you may find that you need them more than you thought. As I now embark on my journey through high school, I believe we can be open to the opportunities to learn from the random people we meet along the way. That is why, on that one calm summer day, in walked a stranger and out walked a brother. It all began on a roller coaster, a beastly monstrosity called the Banshee. I had no interest in riding it, but my brothers, who somehow have a way of convincing me to do whatever they want, pressured me to go on it. And so there I was. As the horrifying roller coaster inched upward, my limbs became paralyzed. I was trembling from head to toe, and my heart was beating out of my chest. Too soon, we reached the top. As the ride rapidly descended, every part of my body dropped. It felt like I was falling out of the sky. Although I was strapped safely into my roller coaster seat and could not actually fall to the ground below, my glasses were not so lucky. They suddenly slipped off my face and fell into what seemed like a black hole under me. I was holding onto the bar for dear life, so I couldn't grab my glasses. I watched them hit my legs and fall, fall, fall until they, were, until they disappeared from my view forever. Back at home at my mother's house, I rummaged through a bin of random stuff and I found my old glasses case. The navy case held a pair of glasses that I had worn in the third grade. They were little and as pink as a flamingo. I put them on and they were the wrong prescription. But that wasn't the real problem. When I checked myself out in the mirror, the tolly that stared back at me looked like a third grader. In case you think that wasn't a big deal, you should know that this all happened three days before I would be leaving to camp. A 12-year-old girl going to camp for the first time in nerdy pink glasses? I was so upset, but there was nothing I could do about it. There was no time to get a new pair of glasses. As the dreaded first day of camp approached, I became more and more nervous. As I sat on the bus, I imagined how everyone would react. I thought that they would see me as a nerd who had no style. I thought that people would make fun of me. I thought of the worst possible situation. But as I got off the bus with a smile on my face, everyone just smiled back and didn't even comment once about my glasses. I realized that they liked me for me, and maybe people judged my glasses at first, but once they got to know me, their judgment was gone. Because I walked into camp with a smile on my face, people didn't even notice my glasses. When someone walks into something with confidence, it shifts everyone's perspective of them. If I am feeling insecure about what I'm wearing, my grades, or my actions, and yet I stay confident, then people won't even think twice about it. Going into high school, I hope we will stay confident and this will give us the push we, we need to go into, the, into high school ready to face anything that comes our way. Early one September evening, at the start of this year, just as tips of the leaves were starting to change colors, I walked out of Ahada Shalom and headed home. I was in high spirits as I walked home from an NCSY event with pineapple pizza in one hand and my phone in the other. Knowing it was a short walk home, I was prepared to get home quickly. For reference, I lived three blocks away from the shul. After a couple of minutes, I looked around at my surroundings, expecting myself to be close to home. Instead, I was met with the look of unfamiliar houses. Where was I? I rushed to the nearest corner to look for a street sign which read, Remington. How do I get home from here? I opened the GPS on my phone, but didn't understand the map. Feeling completely lost in my own neighborhood, I decided that the best thing to do was to continue going straight. As you might have guessed, I was not born with the gift of direction. <laughs> on the other hand, there is no GPS in real life. For any of us, everyone has their own path which they have to form but just as in real life, you can always get lost. The trick is finding your way back home. Everyone is faced with, with force, meaning big decisions, and many, many bumps in their path. Finally, after walking for what felt like hours to the long sound of traffic echoing in my ears, I called my mom. 
Also, at some point, I dug into the pizza. <laughs> Using advanced satellite technology, she did what moms do and dove to where I was. After asking me how I got lost, my mom rolled her eyes and told me that I had gone, that I had walked the complete opposite direction of where I was supposed to. She was right. I did not go backwards, but instead, I kept going forwards. I like that. Even if you are unsure where you are, you only have to push through until you find your way back home. No turning back. In my high school years at CTA, I will develop my internal GPS and continue to grow more independent until I can find my way, my way home on my own. I just hope I'll have my pineapple pizza to keep me company as I find my way to, where, to wherever I want to go. I like to think of life as a very big glass of paint. The people we love and who are in our lives are little droplets of water on the glass. Sometimes when you shift a point of view, some drops just but they're never really gone. You just can't see them. Just like how sometimes in our lives it feels like we've lost someone so dear to us will never be the same. But that's impossible. The people we love most, the people we love most who have touched our lives and changed us for the better are always with us in memory, heart, and soul. We can choose which drops to focus on and which drops to choose to wipe off. We choose what people to surround ourselves with and who help bring out our best selves. If we surround ourselves with the best people, then we will be among the best and be the best. Sometimes those people change, like from middle schoolers to high schoolers. This is a change for us all. For me, going into high school is an experience I've always been so scared of. The thought of standing up and speaking in front of people made me feel like hiding away and never coming back. But then I realized that it isn't just me standing up on a stage all alone. I'm with the rest of my class. Most of them have come as just as scared as I am. But we all took the challenge, and here we are tonight. Just like how we, being little raindrops on glass, join together and run down the stage. Like how we go through this stage of our lives together. And just like how I hope to take the idea of high school and run as hard as I can.
decided that meant we should get in our V and live far away, outdoors. We traveled the country, and then, for glorious quarantine months, we lived in Colorado and skied almost every year, every day. While I learned a ton on that journey, one day in particular is frozen in my memory. See, it didn't take long before I'd skied the black diamonds, the double black diamonds, and the double black yaxes. It was my mission to ski all of the hardest runs on the map. So my dad and I started searching for the elixir of the skiers, fresh powder. And the best powder is off the map. The out of bounds area is unmarked, unpatrolled, and untamed. The warning sign threatens ears to pass with injury or death. There are no ski lifts to get there, no easy rides up. You have to hike up carrying your gear. Getting off the ski lift to hike up the mountain, I was shaking with anxiety. The altitude made it difficult to breathe. My goggles kept falling up, and the powdery snow seemed like blue, sticking to my equipment. I didn't think I would make it up, but I thought about how amazing the top of the mountain would be, and I found the resolve to get there. When we reached the peak, I felt like I was on top of the world. With the blinding white snow all around me, that trek was worth it. It was the only way to reach this magical spot. Then I heard my dad calling me back to reality. I saw the slope ahead of me and I got scared. Looking down at the clusters of trees in the world below, I didn't know if I was gonna make it down. But even with that doubt, I hopped into my skis and dropped in. Fresh powder, sun shining, wind whipping at my face, my father and brother whooping and hollering all the way down, it was the best. Today, it feels like I am once again standing at the peak of the mountain. It's taken years of dedication and hard work. I got here with the help of coaches, teachers, family, and friends. High school seems daunting, but with their support, I've hiked up the mountain. And just like I did that thrilling day, I'm ready to strap on my skis drop in and head to high school. Thank you. When I think about high school, I become terrified at the thought of the work and the responsibilities that await me. How will I survive the homework, labs, and exams? Well, I don't think anyone has a perfect solution to the challenges we will surely see. I know in my experience, I found the way. When I was in seventh grade, I was careless. I never took school seriously and wasn't doing so well. My mom was always warning me about my grades, which made me care even less. At the same time, I felt guilt, as if it was only a matter of time before my teachers found out and I would face the consequences. The thing was, in order to talk to my teachers about my grades, I had to actually talk to them. That's when I realized I also needed to work on my confidence. Something inside me that day switched. Thankfully, Miss Van Gundy wasn't as scary as I thought. She helped me to work on my grades. I learned that the key to success was not being smart or a math whiz, but being organized. Knowing when and what to do is as important as the work itself. Most people think it's silly how I had just figured out the organization was the key. But I grew up depending on others making me think that the responsibility didn't fall on me. Next thing I knew, the school year had ended and I had good grades and a better mindset. I knew I could be better, so I tried hard the whole summer to work on all of my issues I had in seventh grade. On the first day of eighth grade, the old feeling of dread came back, but I was determined to stay on the right path. It was like a weight off my chest. From then on, I always reminded myself of the lesson of organization. Despite that fear of responsibility and consequences always looming, focusing and following through will always be the key to success for me. As summer is a 
upon us. Many of us freshman speechers look forward to camp or vacations or travel. Me, I'm looking forward to my 415 tea time. As many of you know, I prefer to spend my summer mornings and afternoons chasing around a little white golf ball around a golf course. But I've found the sport to be more than that. True, I've missed out on some things while out on the course. I may have missed out on a Shabbaton, missed out on baseball, missed out on other things my classmates have loved. I look back and think, maybe I would have had a good time with my friends. But then I realized I spent that time growing and improving on, and learning a sport that in itself presents so many unique challenges, as well as rewards found nowhere else. While all golf balls look the same to the untrained eye, they are not. We all have unique passions, interests that captivate us and inspire us to improve. Those unique interests should not be pushed down, but rather be pursued and celebrated. For those interests make us who we are. Whatever we seek to learn, shooting a free throw, solving for X, or learning Torah, we can only find mastery through discipline. That little white ball has taught me this. Discipline is continuing to study for the test tomorrow, instead of scrolling mindlessly on the couch. To stay focused and not let one missed putt ruin your round or not letting one confusing question shadow your test score. Finally, this tiny little ball is symbolic of complexity and mystery around us. An infinite number of variables can affect the shot. Swing plane, wind direction, and an, an unseen slope on the green. Even your changing mood can affect the outcome. Not to mention, every golf swing is different. Even the most minuscule variable can send the ball flying in the wrong direction or to the bottom of the cup. Surely success requires perseverance, but also to win in this game, it requires poise, sacrifice, finesse, and sometimes joy. I think we should tee off our round of high school with the lessons golf has taught me in mind. Take pride in our individuality, strive to be disciplined in, in our pursuit of our goals, and have perseverance through all the struggles in order that at our graduation in four years, our names will be on the leaderboard. I've always had an interest in computers. This past year, I decided to build one myself. To be safe, my dad insisted that I call my uncle Sam, who is very knowledgeable of computers, for help. However, I couldn't wait, so as soon as I got the parts, instead of waiting for my uncle Sam's help, I decided to go ahead and install the i7 processor on my own. I thought I had it under control, and I wanted the satisfaction of knowing that I had done it myself. As I inserted the processor, I had a feeling something was wrong. I checked for damage to the pins. Sure enough, at least five of the pins on the back of the chip were bent, unfixable. I started the panic. I started thinking of solutions to this problem, overwhelmed by the threat that I had just hastily broken a $300 Intel chip, and there was no possibility of fixing it. I told my dad. Fortunately, the chip had a warning. Luckily, my dad went back to the computer store and got a new chip to free of charge. After I received the replacement chip, I decided to wait until I could properly install it with my own. I got lucky. This could have been a much more painful and expensive lesson. In truth, this is a lesson I've learned before, but this time, the stakes are much higher. At school, over and over, I now know that I need to ask for help because there won't always be a warranty waiting to save you. As life goes on, and as you grow up, the stakes become larger and the warranties cover less. There are also always people available to help. In turn, this reminds me of all the people who help me when I ask. I would like to thank my parents, all of my teachers, my classmates, my family, including my mom and my dad, and my uncle Sam for the story, and everyone else who is helping me along the way. You know that song, Surface Pressure, from Encanto, where Louisa is singing about being the oldest and how everyone expects her to always be strong? She's frustrated because she feels like she always has to be the one taking care of her younger sisters and the rest of the family. 
She's finally letting out the stress of her responsibilities and admitting that she is human too. Yeah, I can relate. But I definitely don't have super strength. You see, I'm the oldest of six girls and the first grandchild on both sides of my family. When I was born, all of my parents' siblings were teenagers. As a little kid, I was the product of a lot of doting aunts and uncles who loved to play with me and use me as a photo op for their notebooks and lockers. Now they're all old, and I doubt they keep pictures of me in their offices. <laughs> as you see, I have an awesome family, and I'm truly grateful to have grown up the way that I did. But still, whenever one of my parents is sick, or busy, or is attending a gala dinner, I usually have to babysit. It's true. In my own lifetime, I have changed more diapers than I could ever count. Being the oldest has taught me a lot. Yes, I wish I had an older sibling and didn't have so much responsibility. But I think the pros outweigh the cons. I have to make decisions for myself and learn to be independent without the example of any older sibling to look to. I see this as a gift. I am able to blaze my own trail and leave my mark on the world with the support of my family and friends behind me without it being tainted by the accomplishments of anyone else above me. I know, but I know this comes with responsibility toward those who follow. My siblings and younger cousins all look to me as an example of how to behave. It's up to me to be a positive role model and show them how to conduct themselves, take charge in situations, and be kind to others. Similarly, it is now up to us, we freshmen, to begin leading by example. As we enter high school, now is our chance to break our way into the big world out there and make our mark. I know that we hold the responsibility to set an example to a lot of younger kids. But I also know that not having anyone to look to gives me the chance to find my own way in life. See, Louisa, being the oldest is not so bad. <laughs> now that I'm coming out of eighth grade, old and wise, I have the opportunity to share some good, old-fashioned wisdom. Surgery is no pick. As many of you may know, I lived with a condition called the leg length discrepancy. My left leg was a, full, was a full three centimeters shorter than the right. While it didn't affect my day-to-day -day life, it could cause me back and hip problems down the road. The cure for the condition is really ingenious. A surgeon inserts nails into the leg. The nails poked out, are not, poked out and are held together by a metal cage that is wrapped around the outside of the leg. After surgery, every day, I would turn the pegs on my cage to slowly push the two halves away from each other, effectively breaking the bone. Then, my bone would naturally fill in, which would make my lips longer. While you may cringe at this grisly procedure, I learned that sometimes, sometimes breaking something can improve that. In a Japanese art form called Kintsugi, this message is taken literally. When a vase or a piece of pottery breaks, instead of throwing it out, they put it back together, filling the cracks with gold. They take something that's broken and put it together in a way that makes it bigger, better, and more beautiful. Sometimes we need to first break in order to then grow. Going into high school, we can all use this lesson. Sometimes things won't work out well. Whether we have tons of tasks, <coughs> teachers loading up on homework, or even social things, and we feel like we're going to reach our breaking point, we just need to remember that the pressure will help us grow. While the, situ while the situation looks bad, it really could turn out better than we think. Also, we need to learn to face our challenges now so that they don't come back to us later. If I hadn't gotten my surgery now while I'm young, I would have had problems with my back and hips when I get older. So back to my advice, my fellow ninth graders, go on and break a leg. As many of you know, Dance is a big part of my life. I've been dancing for 11 years and I've followed many lessons within this overlooked art form. The movement of your body in a rhythmic way, the beats of the music, expressing my emotions, and letting my body go. I not only found many lessons, I found people that would stay in my heart for life. It came from bringing strangers to siblings, a new strange place to my second home a director to my second mom, and a dance studio to the family. This past January, I participated in the open call dance competition with my dance group, 
Dance Elite Performance Academy. I competed against hundreds of other dancers from around the region in various forms, like hip hop, contemporary, tap, and many more. In the end, while I waited for the judges' ruling for the beat's best performances, I was hopeful. Sure enough, it was, it was one of the last awards that I heard my name. Alma Samuel, best walking of the competition. <laughs> That's right, we were judged on walking, the most basic of movements, a dance we've known even before we could speak. We were judged on how we took the stage, on our poise and grace as we moved through the space of performance. I was reminded that sometimes the most important move is the most fundamental. Walking is the first and last thing that the judges see. You can either walk with confidence and keep your head held high, or you walk like you're forced to be on the stage. In fact, I think I wasn't the only one judging how I walk. We all are. Do we slouch as those scrolling on our phones, or do we hold our head high as we walk through life? How we carry ourselves matters. It doesn't only help us relate to others, but also gives our steps purpose. I learned that everywhere I go, I need to have a positive attitude and have confidence. That's what people remember. That's how we impact others. These attributes I know are important in any phase of life, going into high school, college, our careers, and our lives. How we walk through life, in good times and bad, in the end, is really what it's all about. Give another round of applause for our music. For those who are new to CTA, my name is Avram Drandoff. I'm the head of this amazing school. And I, I really have a lot of nachas from our incredible students, the reflections, the, the, the introspection, and a lot of courage on this stage. Um, I didn't realize how dangerous some of the students may be. <laughs> and I was never more self-conscious to walk up on a stage in my life here. So those are <laughs> Last night, we were blessed to have our high school graduation. And I built my remarks around our amazing experience this past Shabbos and Sunday, where we took a delegation of 27 students, faculty, and some members of our faculty. We went to, the, we went to New York and New Jersey. We had an amazing Shabbos in Teaneck. And we joined 40,000 people who demonstrated their commitment to the state of Israel and our brothers and sisters across the world as we marched down the streets of Manhattan. And I felt okay, I got it out of my system, it was well received, I'll move on to a new speech today. But then I got a phone call this afternoon and everything changed. What we didn't realize, as much as we expected the, the trip to make an impression on us, I don't think any of us realized the impact it would make on others. Uh, yesterday I received a text message that a Westchester Day School who was, who was um, behind us on the parade. Many of the students on their way home, their drive from the city to Westchester, were talking about Columbus Tour Academy, blown away by our dedication, and are willing to drive across the country to show our support of the state of Israel. But I want to share with you the phone call this afternoon that I received. I was in the middle of a meeting, and Lisa, as she always does, calls in, says, Rabbi, you have a phone call. And she says, there's a rabbi from Michigan who's on the phone and wants to share with you comments or a phone call that he received about your students in Manhattan on Sunday. I said, I'll take the call. <laughs> and this is what he said, it was unbelievable. The rabbi told me, he said, you have to be blown away by your students. He said, were you there on Sunday? I said, I was. He says, I want to tell you something. He goes, I got a text message then followed up by a phone call. There was a person with special needs who was at the parade. And apparently has some connection to Columbus. And this is what the person told the rabbi. He said, when your students, when Columbus Torah Academy walked by, they looked him in the eye, they greeted him, they smiled, they said hello. And what the man said is, I never felt so good. He said, I feel alive. I feel so good. It was so amazing what they did for me. That's what our students here do. As I mentioned last night, we travel well, we have their impeccable meetings, how kind they are, how caring they are. And this was, to me, was really an incredible lesson for us. Because here we are just walking down 
sharing, showing our pride of Eretz Yisrael, and what did we know from our kind gestures that impacted me and on others? And in life, we're always put in, we're constantly put in position that our choices can impact others, we can inspire others, or chas v'shom the other, the opposite. And I think our students, time and time again, as you heard tonight, honest reflections, they make good choices, they inspire all. So please join me in once again wishing them a to award the Certificate of Achievements to our new freshman. Eliana Alt. David Buren. Samuel French. Talia Gissel. Bad 
Satya Zuckerman. Please give one more mic. Thank you all. 